Herein there are four words so stark and terrible. I pray that no man or woman here will ever hear them. Yet Jesus said that these four words are reserved for religious people. Four words so horrible, so final, so fatal of all of the phrases I've listed in the series of messages. None affect me when I hear them. None affect me like these four words Jesus spoke in the body towards the end of the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. These four words, I never knew you. I never knew you. Four words you never want to hear from the mouth of the Master. She married with all the hopes and dreams of a newlywed bride. All signs pointed up. The future was bright. When they said, I do, everyone believed it that day. Only one man in the room knew that that vow was tainted. And he took the vow anyway. He was the groom. And he had a secret life. And the secret life reduced that new marriage to room temperature and then to coldness and then to abusive indifference. She tried, she hoped, she prayed. But from the first to the last days of matrimony, he was stepping out. He was stepping out with men. He shattered this woman he married. He left her with this awful truth. I never knew you. All of the time, all of the investment, all of the memories, the courtship, all of the promises, all, I never, never really knew you. It was fraud. It was cruelty. It was wicked. It was mean. It was low. When someone has committed themselves to the greatest intimacy that two people can know and then lives the life of a stranger, a closed book, even an enemy, everything in our human conscience shouts in protest. Is there a more pandemic evil loosed in this world than the violation of the marriage vow? Is there anything quite so responsible for hell on earth as the violation of the vow? The refusal to honor the promise and perform it faithfully. And I'd make my case this way. Imagine if you would, imagine what the world would look like if there were no homes broken, if adultery was simply not tolerated, Children had both parents who, flawed in many other ways, kept the promise of the altar to love and to cherish till death. I dare say that the moral effect alone would turn this world upside down, but then I'm just dreaming, aren't I? We're a, uh, we're a nation drowning in litigation because nobody expects anybody to do what they said they would do. But God expects the performance of His Word. God expects of us obedience to His commandments and a sensitivity to the conviction of the Holy Spirit when His Word has been violated or ignored. These are the words of Jesus from Matthew 7, verse 21. Not, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Then He will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Your name, cast out demons in Your name, and done many wonders in Your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew You. Depart from Me, You who practice lawlessness. Therefore, this connects 
verse 24 and what follows with 21 through 23. And in many of your Bibles, there'll be paragraph and subject divisions right there, and we divorce the two. We talk about this sorry I never knew you passage, and we divorce it from the parable of the builder on the sand and the builder on the rock. But understand, when that word therefore appears, Jesus is connecting his argument. Now, everything he has said in 21 through 23, he is now illustrating and expanding on in 24 through the end. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him, him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the same thing happened. The rain descended and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on that house and it fell. And great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The more I read the Gospels, the more I realize the greatest question in life is really, what is God's will? What is God's will? For if I can discern what God's will is, and I will walk in obedience to God's will, I'll live in the realm of blessing. But if I know not His will, or I do not His will, if I close my eyes to His will, living opposite to His will, then things are going to be falling down and falling apart. How do we know then what God's will is? Well, we find the answers in God's Word. Not in our feelings or our theories or our judgments, but in His. In this passage, there are three points of emphasis. The passage is so incredibly rich. I look back through the records and I've preached this passage at least, at least eight times in the last ten years. And I looked at the messages, and while there are some core issues that are the same, every dimension is different. This is like a multifaceted diamond. And when you begin to meditate on the Word of God, you begin to see how incredibly rich and how deep and how multi-prismed the Word of God is. First, Jesus boldly declared Himself as the gatekeeper. He's the gatekeeper. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's important, and we shouldn't rush past that. We'll enter the kingdom of heaven. It is directly implied. It is inescapable. It is inescapable that he's saying, I'm that gatekeeper. If you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, I'm telling you how. This Galilean rabbi who has the audacity to declare that he decides who gets in. Can you imagine how this must have incensed the scribes and the Pharisees? Can you imagine how angry this must have made those who felt like they had in the religious world the corner on God? Jesus comes along and has the boldness, the audacity to say, I'm the one who decides who gets in. And I use the word audacity with great care because audacity means aggressive boldness or unmitigated effrontery. Jesus had no qualms about offending the people he was speaking to if he was speaking and when he was speaking the truth. You will know the truth, the Bible says, and the truth will what? It'll set you free. I love what Jamie Buckingham once said. He said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you miserable. The truth, when we discover the truth and we understand that our lives are not being lived in, in context of the truth and not in agreement with the truth, that's a miserable place to be. That's where the Holy Spirit brings conviction to bear in our lives. 
But the truth is, by its very nature, going to cause offense. Jesus said, he took it this far, he said, I've come with a sword. I've come with a sword. And when Jesus started talking with him, I mean, somebody should have put him in his place. <laughs> and they tried. But they were blind to his place. They didn't know what his place was. They didn't know what to do with him. They wanted to put him in some out-of-the-way place, but he wouldn't cooperate with them. They wanted him in an off-the-radar place, but he kept emerging. So ultimately, they decided where they would place him. They placed him on a cross. And in so doing, in their own ignorance, in their own ignorance, they had a hand in accomplishing his divine purpose, bringing to you and to me salvation today that we enjoy so richly and freely. They had no concept of what they were doing. They were not mindful of his place, their place, anybody's place. They were lost. They called him a blasphemer because of direct and indirect statements where he cast himself as the way, the truth, and the life. He dared to tell, tell the scribes and, and the Pharisees and were he walking in this day, the congressmen and the senators or the kings or the soldiers or the presidents or the philosophers, the priests, he dared tell anyone who would listen, no man comes to the Father but by me. I'm that gatekeeper. If you want to know God, it's going to happen in me, it's going to happen through me, or it is not going to happen at all. These were the audacious statements of Jesus. He was telling the audacious truth. There is not, there was not, there never will be another way to God except Jesus Christ, sent by the Father and revealed in the Scripture. There will never be a negotiated place where somehow we bring all of the religions of the world together and find a common path. It does not exist. And the moment that we begin to even receive that thinking, we strip the cross of its power and we, die, we absolutely deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The conditions of the work that he did for you and for me. We're just going to, in these modern days, we're just going to have to decide whether we're going to keep Jesus in the church. The real Jesus. We've got to decide whether we're going to have the real Jesus or something phony that we make up. We're going to have to decide because he makes these statements that cause everyone to get a little bit nervous. We're going to have to decide whether we're going to keep Jesus and all of his audacious statements or whether we'll just bow to political correctness and let him go. See, it's all or nothing. He is the way or not the way. He is the truth or not the truth. He is the life or not the life. He is the door or not the door. He is the gate or not the gate. This is a hill I'll die on. Jesus is the only way to God, and I believe him. And I'm afraid that the truth offends. I can't fix that. If there is any other means of finding that eternal relationship with God, then the cross of Jesus was completely unnecessary. A strange and violent spectacle with no essential purpose. Do you realize the moment that you deny, the moment that you deny that he is the only way to God, the cross suddenly has no meaning whatsoever. He didn't have to do that. If there's another way, why would he do that? What, we need another story? We need another legend? What? Why would he do that? What purpose? What design? We don't need to preach, the, we don't need to tell people about the cross anymore. If there are other ways to get to God outside of the cross, then let's release ourselves from this brutal and violent story. Let's step away from it, absolutely. You and I know this morning, we can't. For outside of the cross, there is no salvation. Outside of the one who hung on the cross, gave himself on the cross for you and for me, there is no hope. 
I'm expecting an amen just any moment now. If the Spirit moves you or if, if I don't know if the building catches on fire. After Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to the Father, the disciples, the disciples were put on the hot seat. They got in trouble real, real fast. These raw Galileans were arrested and they were made to appear before the Supreme Court of Israel, the Sanhedrin. I was fascinated for my own reasons watching the health care, uh, somewhat of the health care coverage when it went before the Supreme Court a few weeks ago. And it was amazing to watch the coverage of the whole thing and get an idea and understanding of how incredibly intimidating it was for those lawyers to stand before those judges and make their arguments. And we're quick to jump on the guys who didn't do so well and beat up on them for this. These are brilliant, brilliant men who have got thousands and thousands of hours arguing in a courtroom. Suddenly, they're arguing before the Supreme Court and all of the stakes are up. Can you imagine being put in that situation where suddenly, where suddenly you are arguing in that kind of arena? being before ignorant fishermen who have had three and a half years with Jesus and no time whatsoever in a rabbinical school. You've walked with this rabbi, but he's terribly unorthodox. And suddenly, it's like you've gone to Harvard to sit down in front of all of the professors and defend your doctorate. These raw Galileans are arrested and made to appear before the Sanhedrin. And this was necessary from the standpoint of the Sanhedrin because they had some problems. They had some political unrest. They had some rumors flying around. They wanted to quash quickly. They'd been through a very difficult season in their administration and they really wanted to close this thing up and put it all behind them. And lo and behold, a lame man that just about everybody who went up to the temple, they knew his story. They knew that he was lame. Lo and behold, Peter and John, these two, these two disciples, these Galileans who had followed after Jesus, they walked by the guy. He was healed. He went leaping and praising God and shouting and carrying on and nobody could quiet him down and now the word was out and people were talking and, well, this was dangerous. And the, these Galileans, they were standing in the temple courts. They didn't go off to some other part of Jerusalem or stand outside the wall. They didn't go up on top of the Mount of Olives and ask people to come out of the city. They went right into the temple courts and they preached Jesus there. Jesus, the very one that they finally got rid of. They finally dealt with him. They thought they were done with him and now he's back. <laughs> he's back because of these Galileans. And they thought that they could bring them in and they could threaten them really good and tell them they were going to put them in jail and, and they could silence them and shut them up and send them back to the hill country and be done with these country boys. But the Galileans boldly preached Jesus in the temple courts. You talk about insensitivity to Judaism. Every once in a while people say, you Christians, you're so insensitive. And they're right. Because our message is offensive. You say, well, we just need to, we just, you need to be what the Bible says you're supposed to be. And we need to say what the Bible says we're supposed to say. And if we don't preach the truth, the truth nobody is going to be set free from their bondage. We need to wake up and stop trying to be so politically correct and recognize that the proclamation of the gospel is going to draw some heat. It will. They'll make fun of you. They'll ridicule you. And the Bible says in that you are blessed. Why? Because you are walking in the will of God and blessing always follows the will of God. We proclaim Jesus. He's our only message. And so they brought them in and they wanted to know, I love it, they wanted to know by what power or by what name have you done this? And they didn't roll up their sleeves or bring out the whips or anything. They just said, we want to know. How have you done this? You notice that they didn't dispute what they had done? <laughs> they didn't dispute the healing. They didn't dispute the miracle. They didn't dispute any of that. They just said, we want to know by what power and what name. They wanted to get it all on the record. And boy, we've got the record in, 
in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel and by, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone. He even quotes Old Testament Scripture to them. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become now the chief cornerstone. And I can see the Sanhedrin going, <gasps> And then Peter lowers the boom. He says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. None! None. So Jesus preached no less. He declared no less. Can we proclaim less than what the Bible says? I mean, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He left no doubt that he decides and declares who and by what means a man enters God's kingdom. He boldly declared himself the gatekeeper of the assemblies, uh, the gatekeeper of, the assemblies of God. Ah, I love it. Yeah, we'll, we'll put second service on the web. He's the gatekeeper of that too. He's the gatekeeper of the kingdom of God, which is much bigger, thank God, than the assemblies of God. Then Jesus also presented himself as the judge. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we've prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done wonders in you. In that day. In what day? Jesus here describes a day when all appear before him to give a defense. Jesus is talking about the judgment. The judgment. You find it in Matthew 27 when, and verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from the other as the shepherd divides his sheep and goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared to you from, for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me then the righteous will answer him saying lord when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink when did we see you a stranger take you in or naked and clothe you when did we see you in sick or in prison and come to you and the king will answer and say to them jesus you see us sitting in the place of judgment the king of kings and lord of lords and he will say to them assuredly i say to you in as much as you did it to the least of these my brethren you did it to me then he will say also to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And not minister to you, and he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Jesus wasn't ambiguous on matters of the kingdom or his crowning role in their affairs or his absolute judgment to eternal damnation or eternal life. He clearly declared himself here and in our text as the one who sits in judgment. In judgment. Another politically incorrect idea that happens to be an inescapable New Testament truth. You understand now why I say we had best decide if we're going to keep this Jesus this Jesus we find in the Scripture, we better decide whether or not we're going to keep Him or cast Him aside for a religion of our own making. For you see, He's dogmatic. He's dogmatic. He's audacious. 
He's absolute. He's exclusive. He discriminates. He infuriates. He both embraces and he casts out. And if you're looking for an all-inclusive God with an all-embracing theology, you will simply not find it in the Bible. You'll not find it in the Bible. But you will happen to find an empty throne in what I call the kingdom of nothing. And you can take that empty throne yourself. Set yourself up as your own king and your own judge on the throne in the kingdom of nothing. You see, understand this. In a kingdom where you embrace everything and you believe everything, ultimately you believe nothing at all. Nothing at all. Jesus, with audacious boldness, portrayed himself as the, the gatekeeper and the judge. Should we be surprised if he expects those who claim to have relationship with him to keep his word? If this Jesus we so, see so clearly revealed in the Gospels, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, if indeed He is who He says, then should we be surprised that He expects us who walk in covenant, in the New Covenant, in the New Testament with Him, to walk in abeyance to His Word? This was the sticking point at the closing of the entire Sermon on the Mount. And the whole issue of the house that stands and the house that falls comes down to whether we do or refuse to do the Word and the will of God. That was the sticking point. Religion could not stand alone. That religion had to be backed up by an intimacy and relationship. True religion is, is not simple obedience to a charter or adopting a set of moral principles. True obedience and true re religion comes down to a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that guides our steps not by a sense of law, but more by a sense of love. We obey the Lord. We obey the Lord not because we're just trembling in, in fear over what He has said in the Word of God. No, we obey the Lord because we love the Lord. We believe the Lord. We trust the Lord. We know that His ways are right. We know that His help is sure and certain. We know that this is the way to life. We embrace this. We don't grudgingly say, well, okay. It's relationship. He said himself in John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Jesus said these words to the Father. This was part of his prayer. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life that you know him. Relationship. So against this backdrop, as we've walked into the context of the Scripture now, against this backdrop, let's look at the declaration. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Your name, cast out demons in Your name, done many wonders in Your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew You. Depart from Me, You who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of Mine and does them and does them. That flows directly into verse 24 and what follows with the built on the rock or built on the sand based on the one who does the will of the Father. In warnings concerning false prophets and fraudulent disciples, Jesus said in that day, on the day of judgment, many, many, this is what blows me may many, Many will say, Lord, Lord. Then again, I look around at our nation that is still a nation considered by the world to be a Christian nation. I look at, at Zambia that goes on record as being a Christian nation. I can tell you, you've been on the ground. You've seen it happening there. You know that nothing could be further from the truth. 
Many will say, Lord, Lord. We prophesied or preached in your name. Remember when Paul said, when Paul said that concern of his heart that just flowed over, it was like it just kind of gushes out of him. He said, lest when I have preached to others, I myself may become a castaway. He realized it wasn't the fact that he preached in the name of Jesus. We cast out demons in your name. We did wonders in your name. In other words, we used your name. Lord, we, we used your name. We put your name on our churches and, and we put your name in all of our songs and our music and, and we, your, name, it was, your name was everywhere. It's all about your name. Let me just ask you, don't, you don't, don't we yet find it offensive when people use our names as though we're close, even if we have no relationship? You ever been in a situation where somebody has used your name and, you, and, and the use of that name has been somewhat, well, it's fraudulent at the very least. Somebody goes dropping your name without integrity. I've got to tell you right now, as a, as a pastor, get a lot of calls, people who want to come for ministry or, or want to, to come and see if Calvary will partner with them and this and that. There are a, a lot of, of calls every single week, multiple calls. And I can tell you for me, the quickest, the quickest way to end, the quickest way to end the conversation and the possibility is somebody gets on the phone and just begins dropping a bunch of names. <laughs> People who do that generally don't have a humble spirit. And as your pastor, I'm charged with protecting this space. Part of being a shepherd and protecting you. I'm not going to put up somebody up here who feels like they have to manipulate to get in the door or get their way. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of name droppers out there a shameful moment in your life when you feel like to to somehow give yourself a hearing or to gain some type of advantage you drop a name and you insinuate a relationship that well it's really not there it's offensive isn't it Have you ever said don't use my name don't use my name. District superintendent called me one day and he said, he said, David, I received a call last week and he, he named the guy. He said, I received a call last week and, and um, he said that he had, you know, ministered with you and that, you know, he knew you well and you were friends and he said, you know, we're, I just wanted to, to know, can you give him any recommendation? And for me, it was, it was an awe-inspiring moment. I didn't know this guy. I didn't know him at all. You use somebody's name. You throw somebody's name around. And there's no integrity in that. That's exactly what Jesus said. These who come before me with Lord, Lord. And they look at their track record and say, look at what I have done. Lord. A lot of people look at this passage and they wonder, well, how could they have prophesied? Or how could they have cast out demons? Or how could they have worked wonders? And those things do cause us to, to pause at times, but I think it also becomes a distraction from the key to the passage. The key isn't what they were able to do. The key is that they weren't real with God. I will declare to them, I never knew you. To know here isn't about acquaintance or recognition. It's about relationship and intimacy. And then Jesus says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, or get away from me, you lawbreakers. Here in verse 24 is the opposite of the lawbreaker. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, whoever hears and then obeys, whoever has personal integrity the one who keeps their vows that's the difference those four words i never knew you 
It's terrible to think of, isn't it? It's terrible to think that life can be lived and so utterly wasted. That trust can be so badly misplaced that many one day will expect that their religious lives have qualified them to enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't ever believe that. It's a lie. Eternal life is not corporate doesn't happen when you join a church or even go through some ceremony. It's personal. It's not about religion. It's so much more. It's relationship. It's not just a knowledge of the truth. It's living the truth. These in the word of Jesus. These aren't passe issues that we can gloss over. Rather, it brings us to a place of personal responsibility where we ask ourselves the question, Lord, how well do I know you? How well do I know you? And Lord, on that day, will you know me? You say, well, where do we go? To our knees. To our Bibles. To relationship. To a growing path, walking with the Lord in obedience that follows obedience, that follows obedience, that follows obedience, that leads us further and further away from the old life and evil, that follows obedience and follows obedience and follows obedience. This is the life that we are called to. This is the gospel. This is the core of the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, I pray nobody in the sound of my voice would ever hear these words. I never knew you. Father, I come before you in Jesus' name, a sinner so desperately in need and constantly of your grace, a recipient of the divine life through Jesus Christ, my Savior, my Lord, my friend. I come before you today and I pray for those who may have, oh, they may have embraced formalism, religion, right and ritual rather than relationship with you. I pray, O oh God, that you would remind us of the words that your son said that day. Within the framework of our culture, they're rude, they're intrusive, they're dogmatic, they're absolute, they're troubling. But they are no less truth. And if ever we needed to know the truth, it's in a day that is painted in lies. I pray, Heavenly Father, that if there be one person in this room who has trusted in religion or hoped that somehow in what they do, the place they attend, that will make the difference. I pray in the name of Jesus that they would turn their eyes to heaven today and look to the one who was crucified and, and rose from the dead for them, that this day they would embrace you, O Lord, in relationship, that they would know the joy of knowing you and the even greater joy of being known of you. Ask it in your name. Come to this point in the service, and uh, it's time for us to look in our hearts and ask ourselves hard questions about how we're living out the faith we have espoused, whether we are walking according to the gospel. 
moment. So would you quiet your heart before the Lord for a moment and let him search you? Just let him search you. Would you make yourself available for ministry in the altar in case anyone has come this morning and feels a need of prayer, someone to pray with you. We want to pray with you today. We're trusting the Lord to meet the need, whatever it is. Don't miss this opportunity to just pray a simple prayer in simple faith together, believing God, for He will answer. He will meet the need. It matters not what it is. We want to invite you to this opportunity this morning. And if, if there is one who is here, say, you know, I've never really, uh, never really entered into a relationship with God. I've always felt like that was just a little bit too costly and a little too involved. I'd love to introduce you to that relationship this morning. And I'll be here. I'd love to talk with you. You're welcome to come. Lord, as we move to prayer and as we leave this place, we pray that your blessing would rest upon us and that you would direct our steps, that obedience would mark our way and that in all things we would please you. We ask it in the name of Jesus, the risen Son of God, the way to life. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you.